Today, I'm very excited to host a very special guest, Dr. Kirsten Switza. She is an archaeologist with a research focus in ancient magic and ritual practice. She's doing fantastic forward-facing scholarship, bringing this work to a broader audience online. She's working currently working on a book about magic, ancient magical signs. So Kirsten, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me as your guest. It's it's I'm totally excited being on 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 your um, YouTube channel. I love it. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. I I'm a big admirer of your work. Um, love your channel. Uh, learn something new every video that you put out. Um, and I just want to thank you for your scholarship. It's a it's really a great service to the public. It's so kind of you. Thank you. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> So Kirsten, for those of my audience who are unfamiliar with the Greek Magical Papyri or the PGM, could you give a brief explanation about what they are? Basically, the Greek Magical Papyri or what, what, what's behind the, um, the term the Greek Magical Papyri is a modern, a modern compilation of an awesome body of ancient Magical Papyri from Egypt. They date between approximately the 1st century BC and the 7th century AD. You can differentiate them into two different kinds of primary sources. Ritual manuals, so Greek ritual manuals telling, telling you how to perform rituals and magic. And the other primary source is, is papyri, is artifacts, like from, you know, a, um, applied magic. We have about um 70 ritual manuals and um i think published currently are a bit over a hundred um, um papyri artifacts so th th these are the two main sources um for our study in in ancient magic and for research in ancient magic or basically for our understanding of ancient magic it's the ritual manuals and the artifacts and the greek magic of papyri as the term says papyri comprises all the papyri artifacts and manuals um, but there are also um much more artifacts um, from from different materials, like most people have heard, or many people have heard of the of the cursed tablets, which are made of um, lead, and of um, magical gems. So th these are um, really huge groups of artifacts. But the corpus of the, the the body of the Greek magical papyri consists of roughly about it's already about two hundred um, uh, Richard and artifacts comprised. So the they this the Greek magical papyri were first published in the 1920s from Karl Preisendanz, so the German scholar, and the 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 first English translation was edited by Betz in 1986. And the the Betz translation is what most people actually work with. Uh, it's currently. Uh, the first volume of a new edition um, has been released this year. It's by Chris Farrow and Sophia Torales Tovar. This is like they don't only publish the papyri that were known until 1986. So in the Bets 1986 publication, it's it's 130 um, papyri altogether. And the new volumes will have like everything that has been discovered from then until now. Um, this, there will be um, translations available in, in the new volumes too. It's a modern compilation of all the papyri from Egypt we have about ancient magic. Oh, the, the Greek magical papyri we have from, um, from, from Egypt. The Greek magical papyri seem to be, um, they don't seem to have been very appreciated in history until the work of scholars like uh, Albrecht Dietrich, you know, working on these and, you know, appreciating their values. So I didn't know if you could talk about just the reception up until modern times. The, the earliest modern or the early modern scholars working with this magical text, um, that there, are, there are a lot of Germans um, who did this. And um, that was in the late 19th century and and the early 20th century. And at that time, there was the the perception was that magic is everything that's bad. It's bad. Magic is black. It's dark. You know, it's all these um, curses and harming people. And and there was this 
clear differentiation between religion and magic. Religion is everything that's great and good, and magic is everything that's bad. And actually, the the, the first German scholars translating the the Greek magical papyri that was in 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 unofficial manners, like when Preisendans, who compiled the Greek magical papyri and um, translated them for the first time in, in two volumes and made them available to, to more research, uh, to, to more researchers, um, when he taught this, um, the, the magic papyri at university, he wasn't allowed to, um, to, to use the word magic in the title of his lectures. He had to describe it, but he wasn't allowed to use this to use this term magic. So the perception was for a very long time that um, this magical text that's ah oh, that's that's not the the you know you have the golden classical great um, text from ancient authors or or the the Egyptian pyramid text and um, and religious texts and. They were highly appreciated, and when it came to the magical text, it was like, "Oh no, this is this is this is not even literature. This is it didn't have any value." You know, if you if you wanted to be someone in classics or in your research area, you definitely didn't study magic. So this was a very brave approach of of the first scholars actually dealing with magic and translating them, to translating the the texts and. Um, uh, it's really interesting to see how with the publication of the texts and making them available to more researchers, the our understanding and our approach towards ma towards magic changed. We came from this oh it's it's dark and it, uh, towards a oh well, you know, um See, if you take a look at it, there's a lot of Egyptian religion in there. There's a lot of Judaism in there. There's a lot of Christian elements in there. You have this syncretistic approach. And um, you do have very elaborate invocations, hymns um, in there. You have texts that clearly they are very much older than actually the, the, the texts we have. So it's it shows that there is the knowledge, the people who wrote these ritual manuals and who created the magical artifacts uh, were very well educated. You know, they were very knowledgeable in ancient religion and not just in one religion, but in, in multiple um, religious beliefs. They were very um, familiar with, with traditions, with so, so much knowledge, traditional knowledge. This awareness it came up just because Preisendens and other scholars started to publish these magic texts, despite um, the opposition within scholarship towards the, um, the magical text. We we went to like in the in the eighties, seventeen eighties. We went to this discussion discussion. What is ancient magic? And it was like scholars tended more to, um, well, there is not a hard line between religion and magic we can't really differentiate this and the tendency was there that um you know magic is more like religion because you have very similar gods you have similar traditions or identical um techniques like like the invocation like um sacrifices offerings and a lot of the 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 content actually what you said were were recitations from from older texts. So they, there was this idea. Well, where it's all religion and magic isn't that separated. And then there was there was some kind of rise in the nineties in the study of ancient magic, and then that declined. Now, since around twenty ten, um, the the interest in ancient magic increased drastically, and including discussions, new discussions about what is ancient magic. And how, you know, we all use the term in scholarship, uh, lots of publications like ancient magic, magical artifacts, um, me included. But how do we define this term? Because as a scholar, we should be able to define the technical terms we use. And this is really, really not easy. 
um, not only from from the modern approach because that's what what has been a lot a long time the the modern approach to define ancient magic and um what the 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 turn we, we, we see in scholarship is like trying to understand magic. Uh, we have to do that much more from the practitioner's perspe perspective, you know, from the ancient perspective. And as it is today, there wasn't just one kind of magic and there wasn't one definition of magic or one understanding of magic or one use of magic, despite lots of different terms in the Greek magical papyri for magic, which are all translated as magic, but behind these, these when you when you read bets and you find the term magic, it's very likely that the original term is not mageia, an ancient Greek term for magic, but there are a lot of different terms behind it. So it's a very, ancient magic was very diverse, very complex, lots of different, um, thoughts, um, perceptions underlying the, the application of magic. And on top of that, you had a lot of people practicing magic and likely all with individual approaches. It's all a matter of edict versus emic perspectives, right? Like what do we even mean when we say something's a religion versus something's magic we're defining borders right we're saying religion is what we do but magic is what they did um, exactly. it's very much yep. like an outsider insider defining term both religion and magic are anachronistic terms to begin with you see a lot of bias you know the the early scholars um working with with ancient magic text faced a lot of um, bias towards towards magic and that you still have if you read academic papers from from colleagues from certain colleagues closely you still see a lot of bias and even when they try to to avoid sounding like they yeah, despise is, is a bit tough but you know they they disagree with magic or they 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 think magic is something negative or something minor you can still see it in in the words they use to describe magic how they describe magicians how they address them and you still have this bias but it has become much better there's there's many many young scholars that um approach magic with less bias but with more curiosity focusing on the question and not focusing on your values or your personal belief or your personal attitude but really focusing on on research just kind of making a little cross reference here um when we talk about things like neoplatonism and the classics like you look at a philosopher like plato um and there are certain scholars who want to look at Plato or, or the Platonic tradition and define it in strictly philosophical terms and forget that there was a lot of mysticism and a lot of magic involved in that as well, unwritten doctrines, things like that. Um, John Dillon, who wrote the seminal book, um, The Middle Platonist, coined things like the Chaldean oracles, the Greek magical papyri, Sethian Gnosticism as the underworld of Platonism, the Platonic underworld. So it just goes to show that bias still exists in scholarship yeah. as well. Um, scholars, classic classicists, and um, pure philosophical-minded scholars would go, oh, it's low magic, low, that's what the... Uh, that's what the uh, others were doing versus the, but what the reality is, is that I think when you look at something like the Greek magical papyri, this is more of a window into what the everyday person was probably doing versus, you know, somebody like Cicero or somebody like uh, Lucian or Clement of Alexandria, these elites, in other words, who were literate and had access to these materials to even write stuff down, but to send it to posterity. The people on the ground are going to the local ritual specialist, right, and getting their uh, their their love spells or their spells to um, bind and unbind. You did that wonderful presentation on Patreon about those kind of spells, which I loved. Um, getting to the next point, and this kind of ties into what you were talking about. I just wanted to point out this quote that Hans Dieter Betz did make in his book, um, 
the Greek magical papyri. The religious beliefs and practices of most people were identical with some form of magic. And the neat distinctions we make today between approved and disapproved forms of religion, calling the former religion and church and the later magic and cult, did not exist in antiquity, except among a few intellectuals. So I think this will get, yeah, it's very, it's, it's almost like a mic drop moment there. <laughs> what is the utilization of this technology? What do these rituals tell us about the everyday person? Okay, so now that you dropped that quote, I do have to address it. The first thing is when you hear most people, when you hear anyone, academic or non-academic, hear say most people, that's um, basically an attempt to create the impression of authority. But from a research point of view, it's absolutely worthless um, because it's, you know, who's most people? And in terms of magic or the study and research in ancient magic, we don't know about most people. And we don't know even most pe about most people in antiquity, especially not in terms of ancient magic. So what Betts is trying to do here is to, I think he's he is to address the the turn of, approaching of how scholars approach magic but still you know as if you if you study ancient magic and if you really want to go into the matter and understand it you have to be critical of, of, of what you read the other point uh, is the 80s and 90s where, where what bet quote or the, the the definition of magic here that bet says well um you know there, there is not this hard border and and religion basically is is for most people is some kind of magic that approach is is typical for the 80s and 90s it's it's in, in, entirely doomed to fail approach to head the discussion into the direction of saying it's all the same so religion and magic you know is more or less the same when the goal actually would be to understand the the magical papyri and ancient beliefs thought and actions better because in the moment you say, well, it's more or less the same, or magic is, is much like religion, you put it all in one pot. The reality is, if you look at the Greek magical papyri, they are so diverse and so complex in thought, in belief, in however you want to define religion, but in terms of the classical gods, Egyptian, Greek, Roman, um, Hebrew, it's, they are all there. So you can't just say it's 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 mag magic is like religion because if you look, I'm, you can say generally the Greek magic papyrus, all the classical gods, and then there's some demons and the ritual practices, you know, sacrificing, offering, um, invocation, whatever. That's that's very similar to religious practices. But if you look into the details, so the the technical aspects are very similar. But if you look into the details, like how belief is expressed and what's actually the underlying thoughts of individual rituals and how they work. I don't know if you've ever had a discussion about magical theory, theory of magic, but it's so diverse. There's, there's so much different kind of ideas how magic works. You know, a discussion you don't have in classical religion. You don't discuss how a power how how a, how a god can do what he or, or a goddess what she can do but you do have that in the, in the magical papyri you do have explanations or you can see them when when you read them the text the the ideas and and the approaches to explain how things work how power works how magic works Absolutely. and um that that's different to what Beth says. So I, um, I I had to address this because we are we are slowly heading into this direction to say okay, um, religion and magic is not in in terms of religion is good, magic is bad, but it's also not in terms of it's more or less the same. Um, and it's I think it's really it's much more important. It's really important to to open this door in scholarship uh, much more to talk much more about this that. Um, we're now at a point where many scholars accept that magic is not necessarily low level. And we are at a point where we see, okay, no, no, we should kind of um, level that in terms of our attitude towards it with religion. But 
Now we can safely say religion and magic is not the same without saying magic is bad and religion is good. Just if we could get back to it, like I think the only thing I'd add there is you're absolutely right. When we put things into boxes that are neat like that, like religion and magic, we, we tend to look at it from a standpoint where we don't recognize the diversity within those boxes. We tend to put a lot of diverse voices into this false sense of everything is the same when, like you said, there's conversations going on even within theories of magic and the Greek magical papyri about how things work, the theories and practice. It's very um, important to recognize that. Thinking about magic and what magic is, and especially if you look at the original um, terminology in the in the magical papyri, it's it's like there is so many new doors that open up compared to the to the translation. The imagination and the 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 underlying concept the concept um, of the ancient people um, who practice magic or who, who wrote the, the the magical papyri is so so rich and and complex and it shows so many various explanations just look at, at divination practice and how many different ways you 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 can achieve um um uh, uh, a divination it becomes absolutely clear that these people weren't stupid certainly um they weren't frauds i mean there, there were as everywhere in, in in every business there were frauds too but the the majority of the people and the people who wrote the magic of papyri they were really um intellectually high level you know it's the highest grade of 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 knowledge and and very educated these religious specialists they weren't they weren't like charlatans they they were people living in a very dynamic cosmopolitan milieu you had to be familiar with many different traditions right you had to be familiar with your own native demotic traditions you had to be familiar with the greco-roman traditions the he the hebrew traditions the christian traditions etc these were very well-learned people especially if you if you keep in mind that it was still not easy to get access to books or to scrolls it's not that everyone um had the had the the financial means to own books or to own papyrus papyrus clothes papyrus was an expensive material and not everybody learned to write you had to have access to not only the literature but also to teachers to you know to schools and it's not something everyone had the chance to do so the other thing is when we look at the time the the majority of the magical papyri is dated around the third and the fourth century AD. This is a time when more and more pagan temples, pagan pagan temples get closed by the Romans. So the question is, what happens to the priests? And we know that, you know, in, in, in larger temples and temple complex, there could, could have been 50, 100 or even more priests working there, living there. So what happened to them? How did they make their money when the temples were closed? I think that it, it, that the people who wrote the magical papyri and who practiced magic, um, basically for what, what you said earlier, everyday people, you know, not only kings and, and royalty and for everyone who could afford more or less, these were very likely at least in 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 parts, partially, um, priests. So extremely educated people, the intellectual elite in Egypt. This is something we should keep in mind. That, you know, who were the authors of these texts? Who could have had the knowledge that is preserved in the in the Greek magical papyri, but not knowledge that is restricted to to a leadership elite but um, or rulership elite but that becomes accessible to a broad audience in terms of more people can participate in the benefits of this knowledge i love what you just mentioned there about the disenfranchised egyptian priest this this is a very interesting um, parallel with hermeticism um a scholar named christian bull um recently wrote a book about who wrote these 
texts that we find in the Corpus Hermeticum, he came much to the same conclusion that you did. These were disenfranchised Egyptian priests who oh, okay. were creating these texts. So a very interesting uh, parallel there. Yeah, I mean, and it, it would all check out, wouldn't it? These, these are ritual specialists. They're familiar with many different philosophical and quote unquote religious concepts. It would just make sense that they're playing their trade um, just in different ways, like in, in one sense with the Hermetica um, and the, in another sense with these um, magical inscriptions and, and uh, rituals. And you also mentioned like the importance of the Paideia. Paideia was not a uh, Paideia in education. It was not an inexpensive venture for any family in, in this period of time. And even access to a library involved, even in somebody's house involved much access to access to much means um, you would have to put into that. So I think the next part I wanted to talk about, just to have a little fun, fun here, um, <laughs> I wanted to talk about some of your favorite uh, rituals in the Greek magical papyri. I have a couple of favorites of my own. For instance, I really like the invisibil invisibility spell in <laughs> 120, 1, 2, 22 through 231, and I like the personal diamond spell and uh, of course the very first spell in Beth's um, text you know where you create your personal diamond assistant and it just uh, does everything for you so I, I don't know if you could mention maybe a couple of your favorites that's difficult um so with the invisibility spells and the the personal diamond who's basically a Piedros, and and this is the Piedros is one of the most common rituals in the in the ritual in the Greek magic papyri, um, and a lot of people like or love exactly these two kind of or kind of spells. I think my favorite spell. It's not that I could say it's this spell or that spell. It's spells that provide in 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 mostly in in a in a side sentence some personal information you know or some more personal information about the people writing down the instruction or making an artifact or what i totally love is when you see that someone writes down a ritual and then crosses a whole line out and then the next line is almost identical. It's just like two words that are a bit different or the spelling of the secret name. You know, it's just one one letter is different. And you can literally imagine, you can see the person sitting there writing and then swearing because <laughs> something was misspelled or when, when, when he caught, you know, you have an example in PGM7 where you get the impression that... Um, the, the scribe actually copied from 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 a sheet he had, and then misread the line. You know, you slipped in the line. You know, you started the, the wrong line, and then copied the wrong line and had to cross it out, and then had to had to copy the right line. You can literally imagine how the people sit there like <laughs> like we today. You know, but you know, then you couldn't just you know it, you didn't have a computer. You you had to start all over. And um, I also love the, I love cryptography and, and steganography and everything that has to do with encoding. So I especially love the ones like the Eighth Book of Moses. Everything at the beginning of the Eighth Book of Moses is, I think, steganography, you know, where, where information is hidden. Normally, steganography is, is not encrypted writing, but hidden writing. So... Um, and we know it mostly of from from hacking and from from our, our technologies where you hide information in an image. But the eighth book of Moses at the beginning, the secret, the, the whole eighth book of Moses ritual is basically about gaining knowledge of the secret name of of a very powerful god. And when you know the secret name, you can perform a lot of short rituals, which are very efficient. The description of the ritual starts with images, with literal images, not with painted images, but images painted by words. They are, I think, steganographic. There is the, the real name is hidden in there and the, the way the, there is an artifact that has to be inscribed. And um, the, the, the description of what has to be inscribed is basically encrypted with words, but not in terms of a code, but a picture painted by words. And this is what I, I 
utterly love. And we have one ritual manual. It's the first century. Currently, it's dated to. It's the one with the first mentioning of characters of magic signs. That has been entirely written in code. It's a monoalphabetic substitution code. So each letter of the alphabet is written with a different letter. So it's it's not really a high-tech uh, cryptography. But it's absolutely awesome if you think that a person wrote an entire ritual manual encrypted. This is what I love. And I think it's PGM 12 where we have the encryption of ingredients, you know, where it said that when it's uh, the eye of a snake or was or basically it's mostly it's um, it's animal parts, parts of animals. And then it says what it really means is, and then you get plants, plant parts. I, I, talked about that before. I the, the fascinating thing about this is that we have a lot of ritual instructions up until um, the Middle Ages and today, today, which claim to you derive from ancient traditions and they use animal parts and, and blood, especially blood, blood of snakes, blood of whatever. The encrypted Greek magic papyrus, or the, the Greek magic papyrus says that these were actually codes for plant ingredient plant based ingredients so that i wonder how much of these animal sacrifices and 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 blood and things uh, that that are used you know that are described in in ritual instructions were actually code for plant ingredients we don't have all the 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 plain text all the explanations for the codes and it's really interesting because you know at this point in time in history in antiquity um mysteries and secrets have a kind of social capital right it, it gives you it gives the, the spells it gives the the traditions a kind of prestige right basically the the secrecy is um fundamental existential fear, I could say an expression of fundamental existential fear, because the the ancient belief towards magic or in terms of magic is that it's not something you are gifted, you have to be gifted to perform. But the ancient idea is that magic is entirely based on knowledge, so or can be learned from everyone. Keeping your knowledge secret was fundamental to ensure that you keep your clients. If everyone gets access to your knowledge, everybody can use your knowledge and you know can offer your knowledge. So yeah, that's a great point. You have this all over the, the magic of the magical papyri where the author says, well, keep that secret, make sure you keep that secret. Don't share that, only share that with your first son or something like that. Um, so it's, it was just a very pragmatical approach uh, towards knowledge. I just also wanted to get back really quickly to what you were saying, what you enjoyed about the human aspect of looking at these spells. I was reminded um, of uh, one of the texts in the Nag Hammadi scriptures, um, the prayer of Thanksgiving. Uh, it's this really lofty uh, prayer. And then at the end, you have the copyist writing out, I have copied this one of his discourses. A great many have come into my hands, but I have not copied them because I thought they were already in your possession. I even hesitate to copy these things for you since perhaps you may already have received them and the matter may annoy you. But that person's discourses that have come into my hands are many. It's like you have this really lofty ritual um, invocation, right? And then you have like the, this dude pretty much just like writing <laughs> to the other guy like okay I've, i wrote it out but i'm not sure if you have this maybe you have it maybe you don't it's just it gives it a very human dimension that i love um exactly yeah, those you, are you always the best this, points you have this yeah. real person we actually do have a real letter um preserved um that tell us the, the magic papyri tell us that um this is a letter from, or I got this, um, uh, I, I sent this to you. I, ha I had this sent to you, blah, blah. So that you, that we learn that the knowledge was exchanged, among other things, through letters or by letters. You know, people actually right. put, when we have one letter with a, with a textual artifact, um, but where the, the uh, textual artifacts is, is described, so we know this is the way the knowledge was exchanged. And that is not really very mysterious. 
and and you know it's it's um it's not a secret cult or something like that this is really between two people likely practitioners who are in exchange or you or who met and then decided to to share their knowledge often studies uh, archaeology so is is very distant but here you all of a sudden you know like, like you said you have an invocation or a prayer there and then all of a sudden it said hey dude i love the dude hey dude and, and it draws you yeah. right into the past and into the person you 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 know you really you, it's so real and close all of a sudden you're, you're not distant to some people you don't know their faces and you don't know you know who they are but you boom right there hey dude hope you like it <laughs> all of a sudden like in the middle of your invocation to toth or whatever or whoever you're talking you know it's just some guy like hey i got this uh Got this really yeah. deep cut you might be interested in with the ritual manuals um or the magic books you basically have the 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 handbooks the instructions of how to create for example artifacts or textual artifacts inscribed artifacts and we do have on the other side thousands of magical artifacts in the archaeological record I wrote my phd about the the making and use of um, ancient magical artifacts as they are described in the in the Egyptian Greek magical papyri. So uh, when I studied the the instructions, the artifacts described in there in in the manuscripts, how different they are in in compared to the archaeological record, um, different in terms of in so many terms actually. I have to give you a, a brief overview there. Um, the archaeological record is like roughly between depending on, on what kind of artifacts you, you count with so if you count the demon boats too we're dealing with between eight and ten thousand artifacts from the time span of the greek magical papyri oh, wow. um <clears throat> so yeah it's it's still difficult because you know the the, the largest group are the magical gems the, their number is estimated between about three and a half and five thousand um but it's still difficult and and it's it's still huge topic actually in research how many are actually ancient and how many are are post antique it can be that there is there is that not as many as 5000 magical gems are actually ancient on the, on the other side we do have other um, uh, ancient sources that haven't been really researched by now um in in detail in in terms of the 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 textual artifacts in there like the the ancient greek lithica this is just a rough estimation but if we go there we can see that the archaeological record the largest group of magical artifacts is definitely gems with around three and a half to five thousand followed by the cursed tablets with between well, i think we're currently greek and latin and, and latin together about 1800 for a long time there's nothing and then we have about bit over 160 currently lamelle, so that's gold, silver, tin, basically, tablets, inscribed smaller tablets, and a papyri about the same amount. Basically, we have gemstones, lead, and then is papyrus, and precious, do you say precious metals? Yeah, precious metals. Precious, precious, okay. Um, what we have in the, in the ritual manuals is very different. We have descriptions for about 300 textual artifacts in there, and 268 were, eight were good enough that you have the more or less the, the, the whole procedure, materiality, or the purpose, or the, the inscription. Most artifacts are made of papyrus, followed by tin, and then linen and laurel leaves. So very different from the archaeological record. What we do have, for example, in the archaeological record with all the lead tablets, there are a lot of, you know, the vast majority is is actually um, connected to to erotic and love, and it's mm -hmm. a, a lot of spells of attraction are written down, or we know as, as curse tablets are are labeled as curse tablets. But the ones, the lead tablets we do have in the in the ritual manuals, they are not actually addressing this kind of attraction. They, they they deal with love and erotic, but not with this this you know drawing a woman or a person towards you. I think we have ten or twelve 
lead tablets that are described in the ritual manuals compared to like 1800 in in reality you can't say that 12 and 12 and, and 1800 I, I don't compare the the numbers um directly but i mean like from all the from the the 300 um texture artifacts that are preserved only 12 are made of lead so this is a very small group and in the archaeological records a record the lead tablets are the second largest group so th this is really different I wonder if that has to do with that all the the magical papyri we have are actually from Egypt and but that the cursed tablets and the gems of course we find them all over the Roman Empire so you know if you have them from Great Britain down to Egypt and then from Western Africa and Spain to Crimea and um, on, and and further to the east. So if this is because the manuals are all from Egypt, and actually we don't have many cursed tablets from T from, from Egypt, maybe that there that you know specific preferences of clients were very different in Egypt compared to. Um, other Roman provinces. Another thing that that's really interesting and the in, um, difference between the archaeological record and the Greek magic papyri is the purpose of the artifacts, or the the purpose in in general that that we can um, that we can see in 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 the rituals and in the artifacts. The purpose that occurs most of the time. So um, that that's protection. It's amulets. And, you know, we should think, okay, that's, you know, we have a lot of amulets in the archaeological record. Many gems do not explicitly say uh, protect me or protect the wearer, but we assume that they were used for protection. Um, and in the ritual manuals, we learn that the vast majority of the amulets was created for the magician to protect the magician during the practice. There is not a lot of um, amulets, there's actually only very few amulets that were made for the for the client. And, and then usually in context of an exorcism, you know, when there was an exorcism and then the client gets um, an amulet to protect him that um, he doesn't get possessed again. Most of the, 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 the protective um, uh, artifacts are actually for the practitioner um, the, the, for the practitioners themselves, and then really interesting questions, and, and most of the of the instructions do not provide us um, with an answer. Is could you reuse a, an amulet? You know, when when you when you perform a ritual, and you you need an amulet because when you call upon God or demons, you want to be sure that you know you get you get out there safe. But when the ritual is over, do you have to craft the artifact, um, a, a new artifact, when you perform the ritual again, or can you can you use it? When the when the amulet is made of gold, you can assume that it can be reused. But we still don't know if you have to do like special prayers or invocations um, over this artifact. Um, you know, you speak over the artifact. Do you have to repeat this? And especially when when you have um, artifacts, protective artifacts that are made from organic material, can you reuse them? And then next question: If you can't reuse them, and with some it's clear, in some kind, in some in some cases, the 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 ritual says you it's one time performance kind of. What do you do with the artifacts? I mean, you know, they are usually inscribed with the names of higher powers. And they were created in a context of of, of a ritual manual um, in which higher powers were involved. Can you just throw them away? I guess it might be a question going back to, you know, the the needs of the clients, like the spells are geared towards certain clients and especially artifacts. The artifacts can, can that can be reused might be for a certain clientele versus, you know, one use artifacts, you know, something to explore there, I'm sure. All right. You, you, you know, you're actually at, it doesn't just apply to the, the artifacts that the practitioner crafts for himself um, or, or herself. Yeah. And but also for the clients, um, that's true. I haven't th heard thought about that. Yeah, and it's very interesting just hearing that these um, amulets were mostly for practitioners. It kind of reminds me of um, that whole period of time when the the teachers, um, getting back to Paideia for a second, like the teachers would uh, 
often accuse each other of sorcery and like, like binding their tongue, each other's tongues. Cause you know, uh, being a, a rhetorical master was very important. And, you know, we have lots of these reports of like them trying to protect themselves from the sorcery of another uh, rival. What we do have in terms of the the rec the archaeological records it really seems that egypt is the only game in town just by nature of the cl the climate and how it preserves the papyrus versus yeah. other areas so it really it, it's it might be a skewed record but we have to take in and we always have to take that into consideration that um just due to climate egypt is going to be where the majority of these discoveries are going to be made my experience is that, that there's a lot of people who actually are not really aware in terms of because you, you don't think about it um if you don't have to that actually all the magical papyri we have like the, the greek magical papyri and the egyptian magical papyri they originate all from egypt there there is no magical papyrus from and we do have papyrus from from italy but there is no magical papyrus so far or so far i know of um, um from italy they are also the, the published ones in in preisen and bets they are all from from egypt and when when you read studies and and research um about the ancient magical papyri it always seems so you know especially the greek magical papyri it's so greek <laughs> And you think, mm, well, it's may maybe it is not all that fascinating or mysterious that there are so many Egyptian terms in there, not only gods, but, but language. And when you consider that it's actually, they are from Egypt, you know, even if that's, if it's Greeks that, that wrote them, they still lived in Egypt. And it's very likely that, you know, they, they heard Egypt, the Egyptian language basically every day and they saw the egyptian temples and monuments every day and hieroglyphs the inscriptions every day they were all around them it's sometimes that i myself have to have to remind me and say well yeah they are from egypt <laughs> from all over <laughs> egypt you know yeah, you can be from yeah. south egypt as well you know and um not only alexandria uh, everybody who's really interesting in the study of ancient magic don't study only the papyri um, I mean, it, it's 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 handy because you have the translations, but take a look at as many um, archaeological artifacts as well, because they literally are from all over Europe. At the beginning of scholarship, it was like, oh my God, look here, we we have an we have an inscribed lamella we found in Great Britain, and it's inscribed in in, in Hebrew. Oh wow. And then, you know, you start thinking, okay, wait, yeah, we had the Romans and they had their armies and, you know, they were permanently on war. They traveled a lot. And of course, they, they transported a lot of information and a lot of knowledge and traditions, not only people and, and, and food and, and trade um, um, in, in terms of material trade, but also the immaterial goods that, 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 that were traded. If you're interested in ancient magic, really, really look at at the artifacts and most of the artifacts we have, we know that, that they are magic is because they are inscribed. So um, read them, it's it's awesome. You get a much better picture. When you study ancient magic, everyone is, oh, the Greek magical papyri, the Greek magical papyri. And yeah, it's, it's the, the best known um, body of text, but actually it's just a very, even as Egypt, but it's very local, very small source for the study in ancient magic. And once you you don't only know that, but you you become familiar with the with the artifacts. You know, you it's like this: you're in a house with a lot of locked windows and doors. And the more you learn, the more you see from the ancient source, from the primary sources. Actually, it's like each artifact opens a window. And and you know you at some point the walls fall and and you just see how many people how much knowledge how much stuff actually got in this ancient magic and it's not this it's not just the magical papyri really important and and a tremendous source because of, because of the manuals um, but still it's just it's really basically a small a small slice of cake. The archaeological record, just looking at it 
aside from the manuals that we find in Egypt, it really fills in a bigger picture, like you were saying. It's like um, having one piece of the puzzle versus the whole picture. And, you know, you can make a an analogy to when somebody's reconstructing like a an authoritative text. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Swizza, if you could tell us a little, little bit about your Patreon and your book projects. Thank you for giving me the chance to to introduce my my new Patreon um, to your audience or to our audience. Um, it's Ancient Magic. It's mm -hmm. Patreon.com. Ancient Magic. Uh, you can support me on on Patreon by in, in in sharing my research, in doing the research, and in sharing the research um, with a broad audience. Be the videos. You can become a video patron. You can become a magic science patron. Um, help me, especially support me, especially in in research and ancient magic science. Or you can become a creator patron, and you kind of support all the stuff I'm doing. Um, and and sharing, be it the videos, be it on Twitter or on 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 Instagram. And um, I'd love to see you there. Yes, everyone, go check out. Dr. Swizza on Patreon. Uh, check out her projects. Check out her YouTube channel. Thank you so much, Kirsten. This has been fascinating, brilliant as always. Um, I hope to talk to you soon. Until next Thank time. Thank you. Oh, I, you're I welcome. I totally loved it. it